again, in this particular session, we're just going to go over the fundamentals of describing manuscripts. So the various skills involved, some guidelines, tools and techniques that can be used, and then of course resources that you would want to consult in the course of this descriptive work. Many of you have extensive experience working with manuscripts, so I recommend you to contribute um, you know, your, your thoughts and your suggestions, um, any um, additions to, to what we will discuss. Um, I will just welcome you to chime in based on your experience. So I want to uh, start and open by saying that description is absolutely essential for documenting manuscripts as sources. So you wouldn't be consulting a manuscript, I think, if you didn't intend to, to reference it, to cite it. In order for you to richly and adequately and properly do that, it's ideal for you to approach your consultation of that manuscript as a kind of descriptive exercise. So that's just sort of a basic concept I would like to put to you, and you can be you know, persuaded or not, but <laughs> <clears throat> Beyond that, I will tell you that the more time you invest in description and descriptive exercises, so approaching your, your consultation of manuscripts um, in this way, you will benefit tremendously um, in your knowledge of codicology and paleography, and in general, just the phenomena which are encountered. In, in manuscripts generally. So when you approach it from this perspective of attempting to characterize what you see, not to mention you have a kind of checklist or worksheet that is ensuring consistency and also sort of prompting you to check for the presence of particular features or not. Um, when you do recognize them, you will be able to um, encounter the greater variation in which these various phenomena appear. It will help you make sense, especially from a paleographical perspective, the variety of hands that you may be dealing with and so forth. So con consider descriptive exercises as actually one of the best ways of acquiring paleographic and codicological skill and, and knowledge. Okay, it, you can certainly read until you pass out, but unless you are exposed to um, ver the, the variety and, and so forth, you, you will still encounter something that you can't make any sense of it. Okay, and, um, and sometimes it's very difficult to, to imagine or to visualize what has been described in words, or even if an image has been provided, um, ultimately, you may see a variation on that that you hadn't that hadn't yet been presented to you. So, the more exposure you have, and um, again, approaching with this uh, eye of of characterization will enhance your your knowledge again of these methods and knowledge of manuscript cultures in general. Okay, so you, again, you can be persuaded or not, but hopefully, in the course of this afternoon and tomorrow, you will you will at least uh, have been persuaded to a certain extent of the value of this, whether or not you're fully persuaded to carry it forward. All right, so some considerations. Um, you can obviously approach description at, to, to varying levels of uh, detail. So um, there is an essential level, basically, and then you can proceed from there to increasing detail, mainly according to your available time. And this will range as along this continuum um, of detail from basic observations that simply note the presence of particular features. So you just indicate, okay, uh, middle of the choir marks are present, and maybe you give a few examples of where, to the more detailed end of the spectrum where you actually transcribe and detail a potentially every instance. Um, and note locations within the manuscript where the phenomena appear. Um, again, provide some sort of transcript, maybe translation, even something, something further than that. And again, all of, all of that is a matter of time and sort of what you can afford in any given moment. Um, of another aspect um, that is important to consider, access and handling. So what sort of access are you even permitted to the manuscripts that you would be working with or not? Are you permitted to examine the physical manuscript? That will make a tremendous difference in how you approach your consultation and approach the description. Um, if you are not, then you will need to be prepared to work from digital images. 
And with a certain savvy, there's a great deal that you can discern, even when it comes to things like uh, gatherings and so forth, if you know what to look for. Again, middle of the choir marks or traces of sewing, um, what, you know, et cetera. Um, but um, b paying attention to choir numbering and, and so forth. And even beyond that, it may be simply impossible just because of the nature of the imaging for you to do any sort of collation, but you can at least give maybe a folio count or something like that. Um, as far as paper is concerned in the digital environment, that also might be virtually impossible. You might, unless you are dealing with a situation where you have, say, embossed watermarks, um, or you have something else that is going to be apparent in the uh, sort of direct light environment in which they've shot the images. Um, but all of that needs to be considered. Okay, what, what are you going to be, what are you going to be dealing with? And just in order to be more reasonable with your expectations in terms of what you're in, the detail that you're intending to gather, the data that you're intending to collect in the course of your examination. Another very important consideration when it comes to the access and handling is photography. Is photography permitted? Because if you are able to take reference photographs, then a lot of this work can be um, much more efficiently approached. When it comes to documenting, for example, various um, manuscript notes, instead of spending the time to laboriously tackle the transcription, which may just be <laughs> daunting at first, you take a reference photograph. You make certain that you capture, say, the entire folio with an idea of the particular folio number or other, other indication. Make sure you note that also in, um, in, your, in your separate um, annotations. And then you take also a closer kind of reference photograph just to make sure you have a very clear image of that particular note. And, and then you can work on it later. Okay, you can tackle the, <laughs> the massive project of, of deciphering and, um, and, and working through that note outside of, say, the reading room or outside of, say, the time that you're seated at this computer terminal being given access to, you know, to these images. This is, of course, especially relevant when we're talking about working in a collection environment, say when you're, when you're traveling to, to visit a repository, to consult manuscripts. If you have obtained a digital copy, that's very different. Um, obviously the time that you have is, um, is a little more expensive and open. But um, whenever possible, if, you are, if your access is a little more limited, um, then you need to decide whether or not you're going to be able to take photographs or in, the, in this other situation, how many people have consulted manuscripts at Suleimani Kutupanasi, for example? Yeah, so when you're seated at a terminal there, yeah, you, um, you'll have kind of an ending access, but then there's the question of reference photographs. So <laughs> you need some way to kind of Leave, leave the library with, um, with reference photographs, and that may mean purchasing um, reproductions, certain reproductions. Um, and of course, gaining physical access is much more challenging. That's a sort of different situation. But my point is that if you're only going to be given access to digital images in the first place, you need to think about how are you going to be able to obtain your own copies of those images, if you are at all. Uh, a lot of times there will be a fee involved, um, so you need to be prepared for that. And um, you know there may be other avenues that you can take advantage of. So, just something to, to keep in mind and to remember that um, photography is a very important strategy. Reference photography is a very important strategy for making the most efficient use of your time while you're consulting um, for description for for whatever purpose. Now, also another qu important consideration when it comes to access is limitations on the number of manuscripts that you might be able to request or consult at any given time. There may be limitations when it comes to, if you have an, an account sort of associated or um, if you're submitting requests some other way, they may limit you either in general, like a total number of active requests or um, a total number of requests that you can put in in a particular day or a total number of manuscripts that you can consult in a particular day. So you just need to be prepared for that sort of thing. And again, to take advantage, make the most of the time. Um, and the uh, manuscript number that you are um, granted. <clears throat> now, when it comes to data entry, other imp very important considerations, you want to have established for yourself a worksheet or a template or a checklist, whatever you want to call it, 
that basically lays out the descriptive elements that you intend to address anytime you work with um, a manuscript, whenever you consult a manuscript. The most important thing is internal consistency. So if you modify an existing worksheet, which we'll see a couple of examples, that's perfectly fine. Um, and, and certainly there are recommendations for the elements that you include, but you might tailor that according to the setting or according to the particular questions that you're asking. Just remember that it is always to your benefit to err on the side of greater detail <laughs> because you, you may not be able to anticipate all the questions that you would eventually like to ask. Um, you know, all of the evidence you'd eventually like to interrogate within that copy. And if you have access, and especially if it was like an arm and a leg in three days in Ankara to get access, you know, I mean, you want to make sure that you make the most of the access that you're given. So err on the side of detail, but just decide, set, design for yourself, settle on a particular template, and then endeavor to kind of complete that as you consult each manuscript. Some uh, practical considerations, how are you going to fill this worksheet? So my recommendation is to always have paper copies as well as electronic device for a number of reasons. Um, electronic device may fail you. <laughs> I mean, you might have a backup battery, you might have um, you know, some other situation come to the rescue, but there are just situations where your device may completely fail, you know, it's just unpredictable sort of situation. And at least in that, in that case, you have a backup. You can use a pencil and paper, okay? Unless your hand is broken or <laughs> maybe you'll learn to write with the other hand. But um, in any case, um, you, I highly, highly recommend just um, that you always have both um, together um, and that you maybe even want to make use of, for, cer for certain kinds of annotations, especially if you're permitted to collate and this kind of thing, you, it might just be more straightforward for you to make some um, and some notes by hand, just whatever is easier for you, but especially for backup, I definitely recommend having that. Um, if you're going to be making uh, more detailed notes on site, in situ, then you, you want to know whether or not you can be um, expecting reliable internet access. And you don't necessarily want to be relying on that. So you don't want, say, your work form to only live in Google Docs, okay? Because you might not be able to access the internet <laughs> from, from where you are working, from within the reading room, etc., wherever you are seated. So um, even if the internet access is reliable, you may just not be able to access it. So um, just keep that in mind. Make sure you have other digital copies that you can use on your device um, and also that you have the print. You will want backup for your devices, as I mentioned before, make sure your know, battery is charged and maybe you even have a couple of different devices, you know, kind of that you're ready to, to work with, but um, just think of it as some sort of backup, some sort of alternative that you can use. And then you wanna be very careful about naming your files. So one of the most important things that really should be the first thing that you do is to indicate the manuscript number <laughs> and the collection and so forth. And especially if you're dealing with sub, sub collections, um, within a much larger collection, just any and all detail that, that you can get your hands on to make sure that you note that. And there's no harm in putting that in the file name, not to mention putting things like, that may, you know, may be recorded as part of the metadata of this document, but that it can help you with sorting your files. Things like the date, you know, that you were there consulting. Maybe even if you spent a couple of different sessions, like, oh, afternoon, morning, et cetera, just to help you retrieve, return, and, and, and find the information again, and to keep it sorted so that you can um, navigate it. Um, you may decide that the way you want to approach this is have a single document, with entries for each manuscript, like all in one document, that's fine too. And in that case, you can be a little more generic in the way you title that document, you know, name the file in other words, um, but just be more careful kind of within the document, how you reference each entry and make sure it's particularly clear. So does that all make sense? Okay. Now, when it comes to examination, if you are permitted particularly, um, you know, physical examination, or if it's a matter of, um, consulting in the digital environment. There are a few strategies I recommend, but really this is um, kind of to you, left to you. So um, one thing I do like to do is um, move from the exterior to the interior. So I start with taking a careful look 
at the exterior, checking all edges of the text block for inscriptions, checking the spine, taking a quick look at in-bands, you know, um, and the structure of the, of the binding, um, maybe even beginning with um, characterizing the binding and so forth. Um, and then going from there and just, okay, opening the book and taking a look at the, the end papers or de blur or whatever it is, noting any inscriptions and just going from there and starting and to make sense of things. Um, you can in, in, organize your worksheet this way. And actually the worksheet that I designed for the handout is, is basically arranged this way. So this is what we will be using tomorrow um, in the hands-on sessions when you have an opportunity to consult hopefully two different manuscripts at least. Let me see if I can make this larger. So it basically proceeds as I mentioned where you're, you're starting with some observations on the format, you know, measurements potentially of the size, then working through binding to, to text block and elements of that. Um, and then from there to the contents. So you'll be back and forth a little bit with this, um, with this particular organization. Um, but this is just, a, this is a very basic and condensed version, just given our limitations of time again for the workshop. Um, but this is just one way to approach the order. So a much more detailed approach to this would be like a work form. This is a work form that I use when I'm cataloging, if I can actually get it to open. So this is much more detailed. And I include here information that is particularly relevant for, for what I will eventually transcribe into our um, integrated library system. So this is, a, I mean, quite a bit more detailed, but at the same time, a lot of this detail is um, just more explanatory. So this um, particular work form is, is fashion directly after um, a checklist that appears. Um, actually, Gatchik introduced the site when I trained with him in 2009 before his Vatamekum was published. But in the end of, in the appendices of the Vatamekum, he has like a descriptive checklist and it's very similar in terms of the, the descriptive elements that are enumerated there. So this is an example of a different type of work form. Again, you would want to kind of um, design your own. For my own work, I think I can probably show you what I have done before. Speaking of Suleimania, so here is an example of a way, like working with Suleimania manuscripts, where I organize my own kind of notes, um, working with each um, manuscript. So just being careful. Again, you can see I'm not, it's not formatted, formatted as formally, but I'm still being very careful to get, collect and gather the same sorts of data for each of the manuscripts um, and to note, um, you know, when and when and where and which manuscript and so forth. <clears throat> and again, Suleimania, this was a situation where I was sitting at a terminal looking at images, so for the most part. Um, okay, so these are all kinds of different approaches that you can take to the work form itself. And, oh, but ultimately, um, that is up to you in terms of how you, um, how, you, how you structure it. There are certain recommendations I can absolutely make in terms of what descriptive elements you, can, you include, but as far as the arrangement, the order, that is a little bit up to you. I do recommend also, if you are going to be collating, so that situation <clears throat> may um, only occur really if you are being asked to provide a detailed description. Um, or if you um, have expensive time to spend with a particular manuscript, perhaps you've decided that this manuscript is incredibly significant. I, for example, um, working on the transmission of Sharani's Al Mizan al Kubra, um, I have identified what most subsequent copyists believed was an autograph, so in the hand of the author. And uh, therefore, I spend a great deal of time checking very carefully the collation. And I discovered actually that a number of the folios right at the beginning are out of order. Okay, so that's a situation where, because you've just, you decided that this manuscript that you're working with is quite significant, it, it behooves you to try a collation, attempt a collation. Um, but again, if you're not doing that, if you're not collating, if, you, if you're not essentially gonna work through, look through the entire manuscript, um, 
then you might approach this differently. There might be um, another strategy, just look at enough to maybe assess a few gatherings, in other words, check for the presence of middle of the choir marks, check for choir numbering, flip through and, and notice if you see annotations on the margins, et cetera, without necessarily looking at every folio and every page. Um, when it comes to examining the paper or other writing material, you wanna look at as much as you need. And really, the more comprehensive you can be, the better, because there will often be variation across the codex, multiple paper types, in other words, that you'll encounter. And so, again, if you're intending to be thorough, if you're intending to be comprehensive, then my recommendation, and this is what I advise for anyone who's cataloging manuscripts, is to actually examine while you collate. And especially if you're also going to be doing something like foliating or paginating within a, you know, a manuscript within a collection, like for a collection, for collection access, that you just make this part of your um, routine. As you're going through and making your careful collation, you also make note, oh, on folio so-and-so, there's the middle of the choir mark, or on folio so-and-so, there is this, um, uh, middle of the choir marks will come at kind of expected places, but on folio so-and-so, there is a collation mark, or a collation note, or on folio and so-and-so, there is a pen trial, or on folio so-and-so, we actually transition to a whole different work, <laughs> you know, because it's a mejmoa or a, or a codex that actually contains multiple texts in it, you know, a collective volume. So um, examining what you call it just makes things more efficient. Um, as I've already mentioned, I can't emphasize this enough, um, document using photographs as you go. So, so to the extent that is permitted or to the extent that you can capture the photographs, um, then make sure that you do that just in the interest of time because that way you can return to the more laborious work of potentially deciphering and transcribing later on. Sometimes it will be really, cer certain transcription will be worth your while regardless. Um, especially things like, we'll, we'll get into this later, but essential elements would include titles, you know, any sort of, any sort of variation in title that you encounter, the opening of the text, as it exists in the manuscript, as it's attested in the manuscript, and the conclusion of the text, which in Latin is referred to as incipit, to an explicit. I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing that, pronouncing that correctly, but um, then also the colophon. And I was having this discussion after the session earlier. So there are authorial colophons and there are scribal colophons as well. So we kind of collapsed it a little bit, but usually what you see, the shapely, the shapely type, is, is, a, is a scribal colophon, but often there will be a preceding authorial colophon that may not be distinguished in terms of layout. Um, again, primarily we focused on the, author, the scribal because they are distinguished in terms of layout, but um, you wanna you pay careful attention to that. Um, and that is like one essential element. That's something you want to take the time to transcribe because you wanna sort of make sure um, that you've made sense of that, it will help with making sense potentially of other things that you're observing. So if it looks, if it's in Talik or in some like, <laughs> heaven forbid in like, I don't know, Diwani or some like an indecipher, initially into you indecipherable script, then you might want to just document and, and return to it later. But it's the sort of thing that is really essential that you eventually work on. Um, and otherwise, you know, just document so that you can return to it later. Then of course, you wanna follow the reading room guidelines. <laughs> you don't want to violate the, um, the norms and protocols of, <laughs> of the institution that is devoted to the preservation of these manuscripts. You know, so when it comes to handling in particular, um, if they have preferences for the use of supports or the use of weights or the use of um, light sources for examination or um, whether or not you uh, place slips to mark spots because something you might want to do <coughs> excuse me is to like mark centers or mark where you found an interesting note on the margins or whatnot um, they might have um, preferences regarding whether or not you do such a thing so just make sure that you orient yourself very graciously very um, respectfully um, in, in, invite them to let you know what they prefer that you do and then when you have if you have a question that isn't kind of part of their typical protocol just ask them first like before you do it you know just in the interest of not um, riling anyone um, because it's all most most places are so generous I'm um, but there are plenty of plenty of folks that are 
um, we don't have to spend too much time on this, but it'll be mostly individuals that um, are, they have an interest in kind of, you know, dominating the situation and <laughs> they may not be as open and as welcoming. So, um, and they may be offended if you take an approach that they are not comfortable with, or if you simply do anything without consulting them first. So just keep that in mind. Um, but again, most, most places are really um, invested in accessibility and ensuring that you have a meaningful um, experience consulting the manuscript. So there's no need to assume the worst, um, but certain places do have reputations. <laughs> Um, now, tools that you can use and that you would want to use. And I just realized for the later session, I have a set of you know, such things that I will show. You want clean hands, or if you're dealing with a situation where you have like a metal case. So we looked at an example of a scroll that was, that was uh, tucked inside a metal uh, case or enclosure. Um, if that is something that you're being permitted to handle, you want to be prepared to handle that with, uh, with gloves. And um, nitrile gloves, or what would seem to you like rubber gloves, are, um, you know, the preferred um, for, for metal. Um, uh, cases like that, bindings, etc. And otherwise, clean hands are preferred. Why? Because actually, you're less likely to do damage if your if your hands have a greater tactile sense than if they when you're working with paper when you're working with uh, works on paper than if you had actually gloves on your on your hands um, you could they could snag you could be more likely to to tear damage etc because you wouldn't have the same tactile sense and with clean hands there's less risk as far as you know, transfer of any oils or dirt or, or whatever might be a possible concern versus the risk of like doing other great, much greater damage in the, in, the, in the sense of tearing or snagging or something like that. Does that make sense to everyone? I know a lot of people wonder about gloves versus not, <laughs> versus not gloves. And usually the, um, like the, the rubber gloves and the nitrile gloves will be supplied to you. Um, so it's not necessarily something you need to have in your bag <laughs> when, you know, when you're going in. But you can. I mean, you can have it, certainly. Um, another tool that may or may not be supplied by the reading room will be something like a ruler or a tape measure. The one thing I can say about this is just, um, especially if you're visiting multiple um, repositories, collections, have your own ruler, have your own, tape measure is more compact, that's why I mention it. I can show you, I'll show you an example later, the retractable ones. Just use the same every time for internal consistency because believe it or not, there can be a little bit of difference from one ruler to the other. So as long as you're internally consistent. If you happen to forget yours or whatever, there may be one you can borrow, but you don't wanna rely on that. A lot of places will have that and they will offer it to you, but. Again, if you have your own, then, then that is even more reliable. Another tool is a light source, like a light wand or a flashlight, or ta-da, your phone. Your phone has a light on it, okay? So if they permit you to have your phone, which most places will, then you have a light. Um, and this is, I will demonstrate later on, this is especially valuable, this is very powerful. I mean, this is, I'm not gonna speak about the model of this phone, but most, most mobile uh, flashlights um, are very powerful and very effective uh, light sources for transmitted light, observation and transmitted light, which you will want to examine um, when you're examining paper. There may be a light source available to you at the repository and they may have very strong feelings about what they prefer that you use. So again, you want to follow those indications to the extent that you can. Um, some common things you can encounter are light sheets, uh, light boxes, um, lamps, um, light wands, like I will show you an example of a light wand later, um, and just kind of go with the flow. If you can, you might be able to demonstrate to them, well, actually, this is gonna be more effective than that light sheet. But again, you can, have a com you can try and have a conversation about that um, and just be as generous and respectful and gracious as you possibly can. 
weights and supports that will usually be supplied so you don't necessarily need to be carrying around your own weight your own support although a felt roll very compact if you get a length of a long length of felt from a fabric store roll it up you have your own support um but you don't most places are going to if you're a, if you're granted access to the physical objects they're going to be supplying you with whatever supports they prefer you use and if they don't automatically do that you just ask them can i you know i need a support weights are for holding the book open and so they, you might hear them called snakes or you know other sorts of things but it's it's weighted um cords or um how to say like long coils or strips of fabric, often velvet or or felt, that that literally have like shot, like <laughs> like buckshot in them or something like lead, very heavy, so that you can lay it gently on the book without damaging and hold it open. So that's something that you will likely be expected to use rather than using one hand to hold the book open and you know another, which can lead to um, damage. Another um tool as the pencil and paper as well as your electronic device you want to have some way of making notes you're not going to remember everything <laughs> and not be able to to register it all in your mind you need to be able to record it so um the one thing i you know i didn't also put here of course is whatever you're going to use to make photographs i'm kind of assuming that in your electronic device maybe you also have um a a device for photography, but that um, is really essential. Some repositories will have, maybe that's what I'll add to, this, to the list just to make it explicit, but some repositories will have a camera that you can borrow. Um, some will not. So it's always a good idea to make sure that you have some way of doing that. I'll, make, I'll just make sure to add that so it's explicit. Okay, examination techniques. So what are the sort of techniques that you're going to be using? Well, you're going to be measuring. You want to measure the exterior, the you know, the binding. Um, you want to measure the text block, um, especially if there's any like significant, again, in most cases that that difference should be very small, like within a few millimeters or so, if, if any significant difference. Um, but you want to measure the text block. Um, you want to measure um, the dimensions of the written area. So trying to get at the dimension of the ruling board or frame. Um, and, and so forth. Then, yes, yes, Linda. Written area. Yeah. So oh yes, it's a question of language, isn't it? Yeah. So by text block, I'm talking about the collection of folios. So the physical um, assemblage of gatherings, okay? So it's basically the dimensions of the folios. That's what I mean by that. So that's just a term that's used to refer to that, that collection, the text block. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I <laughs> didn't bring my models today. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so this will help illustrate. So, so this part, this part is the text block. So you'd measure here here, here, the, by contrast with the closed volume, this is gonna diff, this is gonna, these dimensions are gonna differ, these measurements are gonna differ a little bit because this book has squares. So the cover extends a bit past the dimensions of the text block. Then the written area, which some people refer to as a text block, will be this part that's written. This doesn't have a defined, like this, when you have, if you have rules, or frames that are drawn, you can measure there. If you can see the impression of the ruling board, then you might want to measure from that. That's always a question that I have because sometimes because they don't always uh, coincide. Like sometimes the frame actually extends beyond, you can tell that it extends beyond the dimensions of the mastara. Um, and so you just have to decide and then be internally consistent with what you're gonna do. But does that help, Linda? Okay. <clears throat> So measurement, so that's one technique you're gonna use. You might also be using measurement for um, the, and are we gonna get there? Let me see if we're gonna get there. Yeah, so within the paper. So measurements of like the spacing between chain lines, 
um, the spacing between groups, the spacing between the individual chain lines, then the what a typical measurement is the distance spanned by um, either like 10 um, laid lines or the number of laid lines in one centimeter. Those are standard measurements to characterize the, um, the morphological feature, the mold characteristics for a paper. So those are measurements. And then measurements say the length of the watermark or height of the watermark, something like that. Those are other measurements that you'd want to be taking. And obviously you need, to be able to safely do that, you need a, a way to observe safely with the transmitted light and then also to, to place the, the ruler or tape or whatever you're using to be able to measure. So that, that's going to be a delicate situation. You want to be especially careful when you're doing that. Um, sometimes in that situation, actually something stiff, like a, like a ruler versus a tape measure is sometimes a little bit easier. Um, and especially kind of make sure that your like tape measure doesn't have like a jagged piece of metal because <laughs> you don't want to necessarily like drag it across the page and and carry off some like friable pigment. <laughs> so, you know, just be conscious of things like that. Try to ultimately, it's really better if you can avoid placing anything against the surface, but you know, within, within reason, within reason what's gentle. So those are things that you'd be measuring. Um, as far as collation is concerned, again, you can do something very simple where you simply note the number of folios or pages as they are themselves numbered, where you just kind of, okay, this is just how it's reported, you know, you're going to accept that. And then maybe you do a little bit of analysis to say what in general you're seeing in terms of the composition of the choirs. Like you're seeing quite a few quinions or, and so you maybe say mainly, mainly quinions or chiefly quinions, or maybe it's seems to be mostly quaternion. So you can just say something like that um, without being precise um, and comprehensive and exacting in no collation formula. Of course, if you're being detailed, then you're gonna go through and produce a, a careful collation with a full uh, collation formula. As far as other techniques, viewing in transmitted light. So again, this is how you're going to assess the qualities, the morphological features of the paper, observe watermarks, um, view the laden chain lines and measure them. So again, you wanna make sure that you can do that safely. There's actually a lot you can do um, even without having to use a light source um, be, of, of, you know, from a device because if the lighting is such in the reading room or wherever you are working, there may be enough light entering from the window that if you just position yourself right, you can get the light coming through um, and blocking the light from overhead in such a way that you can actually see pretty well. But um, all of that is really difficult to convey and, and very much varies by setting. And so you just wanna, um, you wanna gain experience and, and, then, um, and then see what's manageable in the particular setting that you're newly working in. Um, raking light. So another technique that can be useful is observation in raking light, especially when you're looking at ruling um, brined ruling, or in on the say that involved in the tooling of the of the leather cover, for example, or if you're looking for blind ruling on or scoring on parchment, um, or if you're looking for pricking, um, or if you're looking for other elements of the the finishing of the of the binding, or elements of the of the paper surface, um, usually. The burnishing will be a little more apparent just in ordinary kind of direct light. So um, just attend to what's, what's possible to view and kind of adjust you know, your angle and so forth. It's better, better to move you than to move the book. So if the book is stationary on the table, you can move your head and move, <laughs> move your body don't don't lift pick up the book and like try to turn it and adjust it with respect to the light it's better to move you than to move the book so um kind of a rule of thumb <laughs> <clears throat> and then of course gentle handling to the extent that you can do this um again following the rules of the reading room so turning through the pages and checking carefully pressing to check carefully to see for the uh, sewing if that's visible at the centers and, and so forth. So using, using gentle handling 
and then careful attention to whatever supplied images that you may have um, if you're not granted access to the physical object. Okay. So as far as the elements, shelf mark and collection details, this is essential. And I've kind of dis I've starred the things that are just absolutely, absolutely essential. Um, again, because you you want to have an idea of of what particular manuscript you looked at um, to be able to um, align that with catalog data, um, with any citations um, exist in the existing literature, and and ultimately to respect the repository by properly attributing and citing the work that is preserved in that collection. So that's really essential. And you know, if you can follow an established practice within your field, within your discipline, um, as far as formatting, but usually you can just follow the lead. Some libraries, um, like for the collection at Michigan, um, I provide a suggestion of, of how to cite. And some libraries will do this for you, um, especially if you're going to be publishing an image or otherwise like citing a, you know, an excerpt in a footnote or something like that. You just want to follow the convention that is suggested to you and otherwise follow the convention that is suggested by your field. Um, so, but make sure that it is unique and, and it ultimately can result in someone else being able to consult that manuscript. They could use that information that you gave them and eventually if they had the resources, they could also consult the same thing, if that makes sense. Another um, is format and size. So size, especially if all you have access to is digital images, <laughs> you, may, you, you just may not be able to evaluate size for yourself. You may just have to take whatever word is provided in the catalog data that's accessible to you, if any, um, and otherwise leave it as is. Um, but if you do have physical access, it's, very, it's, an, it's really valuable to record size. So if you have physical access, it's essential. If you don't, then it's, you know, it can't be. The binding. So unfortunately, like in some digital environments, you might not have images of the binding. The cover in particular, there may be elements of the structure, the sewing and so forth that are obvious to you, but um, the binding also may not be something that you, that you technically sort of have access to. But um, where you do have access to the binding, um, it's pretty valuable to document that. Um, there may be situations where you decide because of limited time, it's not absolutely essential, but again, if we're erring on the side of greater detail, then, then you'll want to include that. Gatherings requires the collation. Again, this is not necessarily essential, um, but if you want to be comprehensive, if you want to be providing, you know, ult um, greatest accessibility, so you, you know, you're cataloging for a collection, then yes, you want to provide this. And otherwise, you'll sort of go with what you can. Um, a, folio, a folio count, um, maybe a, you know, a kind of general assessment of what you tend to see in terms of the types of, of gatherings, um, and otherwise, leave it at that. The writing material support. Now, you might, <laughs> you might say, is this essential? Is this not essential? I will tell you this is essential to the extent that you have access. So even though, of course, this is something that a lot of times in the digital environment you really can't assess, I've still started because of how important it is. So earlier there was the manuscript of the Sindibad um, uh, tale. And actually that paper is watermarked. So we have a very good idea of the dating based on the watermark. Um, and and so, and I mean, I can say more about that later, but often that may be the only recourse you have to dating. If there are no other annotations, there are no paratexts that are, that are lending dating, et cetera. And you don't want to regret not having that information later. So as I said, um, erring on the side of greater detail um, in this particular instance is really valuable because you may have no other recourse when it comes to dating. Or you might feel like you don't, you, you don't have recourse to dating or you don't have an idea of the dating. Um, but you really could have if you examine the paper. Um, I, one, of, 
one of our students I know initially visited a repository in Tunisia. I believe this was in Tunisia or in Italy. Um, and had examined quite a few manuscripts without yet being familiar with you know, these approaches for examination. And then greatly regretted that he had not also examined the paper. But fortunately, when he, he was able to visit another time, and he was very careful about documenting um, characterization of the, of the writing material. Layout. Layout's pretty important, um, essential. So what we typically do with layout is count the number of lines per page. So that's a standard reporting within, within layout. And then, of course, indicating if, if you're not. A single column is kind of assumed because most, um, uh, not, not to privilege prose, but ultimately that's what it does. Um, if you have division into two columns, though, you definitely want to note that or, or four columns or whatever it might be. And then if you have, if you can tell that it's a part of the um, prescribed arrangement uh, within the ruling board to also have text on the margin, then you, you definitely want to mention that too. So another thing that's really valuable is when you see any variation. So just like with, with writing material, if you see any variation in layout, like if the number of lines per page is changing, becomes more compact or, or something like that. It's good to make note of that. So layout in general is something that's quick, um, relatively straightforward to do and can, and can be revealing. So I consider that essential. <clears throat> ornament. Of course, depending on the questions you're asking, ornament will be essential. <laughs> that may be precisely what you're studying. So that's really essential for you to characterize, um, to capture in photographs and so forth. Um, but ultimately, it depends on the questions you're asking, and it depends on the amount of time that you have, and wh again, whether or not you're going to um, you know, be going into a detailed characterization in the moment, or whether you're just going to take the reference photographs and then go into the detailed characterization later. But regardless, you should note things like um, Unvan, Sarlo, um, you know, an, an illuminated like double page opening, an illuminated headpiece, um, frames, cloud bands, use of contrasting ink, um, all of these sorts of things um, are really valuable to at least note the presence of and where, and especially because you may have these appearing at multiple places within the manuscript. Um, maybe it's a copy of the Khamsa Nizami, and at each, at the opening of each, um, the Masnavis, then you have like a, an Unvan or, um, uh, illuminated opening, double page opening even with marginal decoration. So you want to make note of that. That's going, to, as I said, that's going to be essential in cases where it pertains directly to the questions that, that you're asking. Script in hand, script in hand. <laughs> Again, really straightforward, something I consider essential, um, at least to characterize the script model. Nas, nastalik, maghrabi, nas, nastalik. Anything else <laughs> that it might be? Um, that's what we mean by script. So giving the script model and then trying to characterize the hand. And so, and depending on the script model will vary a little bit. Like with Nastalik, for example, Nastalik is almost always serifless, the vertical um, strokes, the ascenders, um, particularly um, isolated Aleph, almost always serifless. So you don't necessarily, you don't necessarily need to mention that. Um, what you would mention is if for some reason you saw serifs, like head serifs in a nostalgic, then that would be notable. So you might want to mention it. Um, otherwise, um, with nas, it's really important to know if you're dealing with head serifs or not. And what maybe what type of head serif? Is it left or is it right? Or is it, um, you know, is it sort of barbed or is it slightly curved, you know, et cetera. I mean, th these are the sorts of things that you can sort of go into when it comes to characterizing the hand, but it ultimately is a function of the script model. Um, I, I, we talked about this a little bit yesterday and we can talk about it more um, later today, but um, you can sort of settle on standard aspects for each script model that you would address or not. Things that I typically do pertain to, especially with NAS, um, is final, does final calf have a, a shak or a, um, a, a vertical, like ascending stroke? Do you know what I mean? Um, they have a board. Yeah, and also called shak. <laughs> so um, 
if that is present, because it doesn't only appear in Persian, but sometimes will appear in, in Arabic, then you want to mention. So some, that's another example. Or kef mabsuta, which is actually one where it curves around like this, kind of flattened. Um, so this letter kef is one that you may want that that you may want to characterize. Another letter to focus on besides kef, besides aleph, for example, would be noon. And like, um, for example, final noon, isolated noon, what shape does the bowl have? Is it tall and narrow? Is it short, flat, you know, and kind of rounded and kind of expanded? Is the point set down in the bowl? Or is it above or right at the top? Is the, is the point of the noon um, joined to the bowl? <laughs> you know, these are all sorts of things that you can sort of begin to characterize to distinguish the hand. Um, other, other indications are like um, any inclination or leaning of the letter forms, um, descent to baseline, which you expect with Nostalik, but not necessarily with other scripts. Um, what are some other? Pointing of Aleph Maksura, we were talking about that earlier. So if you have a word like ila in Arabic, are they pointing instead of just leaving the alaf maqsura without dots? Um, because that can be a clue. As I said, I was, as I was saying earlier, there is a tendency, especially like in, in the context of Egyptian hands, to dot the alaf maqsura. So that's something, or the opposite is true, like in an Ottoman context where even where nothing is pointed, ya is not pointed. So alif maqsura is not pointed, but also ya is not pointed. So one way or the other, this is another good letter to attend to. So anyway, you, you can settle on that, you know, there are some suggestions and some models for what you actually address. Um, and I again recommend that, um, you know, you can look at samples in catalog, samples in the Michigan catalog, you can look at samples on this research guide, which I mentioned, um, to, to see particular letter forms. But if you're noticing some an idiosyncrasy, um, you know, from a particular scholar, uh, excuse me, copyist, um, you know, then you definitely want to note that, pay attention to that. But it's helpful to have some idea of what you're going to be checking for and, and and looking for in the first place to be able to note these, um, to even be able to assess these idiosyncrasies. I'm sure we'll have other thoughts as things go along about particular letters. Are there any other letters that anyone would like to mention that they usually pay attention to? I mean, I already mentioned counters yesterday. Those are really good to pay attention to, but. So another thing is like with lamb or, or kef, so sometimes with lamb, sometimes lamb will be very rounded, it's, it's, it's foot. Um, sometimes it will be just like a vertical, like flattened stroke. So that's another good letter. So these, we, di we distinguish these by ascenders, descenders, and Gatchik has a, a excellent like range of terminology to, to refer to them and distinguish them. Um, so we could talk probably too much about that. So I will stop unless anybody has any other contribution. Okay, contents. So that obviously is essential. <laughs> um, so the visual content as well as the texts and, you know, composition. So um, meaning the tech, various titles for the text um, in terms of what is internally um, attested and what you may know from um, sort of standardized um, works on the subject, other copies of the work, editions of the work, um, biobibliographical sources, etc. So that you have, okay, how has it been called? How is it? How has this this treatise been referred to in this manuscript? What is the title assigned in this manuscript? And potentially, various titles across the manuscript compared with what we know to be a kind of uniform title for this work. And then what is the attribution? So in the manuscript, to whom is it attributed? Like, is, um, is it uh, identified a particular author, like say in a, in a title piece or in the colophon? Um, or do you have just, do you have any identification of the author him, um, of their own that they actually include in, in the preface or the opening of the work? Um, so getting at whatever is internally attested relating to 
the identification of the work, the title of the work, and also um, the author. Now, identification may not be that straightforward. There may not be a title um, readily um, ascertainable. And what you may have to rely on is actually identification by the opening lines of text, this in Chipet, you know, that if we're talking about. So um, usually where we would start that would be after the Basmila. You can include the Basmila if you like, but um, ordinarily what is going to be more variable is what follows these formulas that actually tend to open, the, almost always the best is opening. So then what follows that? Um, that, would, that could be where you begin. You can either continue, there will tend to be a lot of formulas even following that in praise of the prophet and so forth. You can certainly transcribe as much as you wish or you know, photograph as much as you wish to document it. But ultimately when you're transcribing, um, either include that or continue to the Wabad, <laughs> where often the author will venture into the further sort of meat of the of the of the preface or the opening, and that eventually they may often reach a point where they give the title that they have assigned to the work. Um, it's very typical for them also to indicate that organization, like that they are presenting this in five chapters and a conclusion, you know, something like that. And, you know, you can include some of that if you wish, but ultimately what will be m most distinguishing will be a little bit before that. But the idea of doing this is that this distinguishes this work from an, any other work. And so just like a title, it is a way that you can identify. And a way that you can do that once you have it is by searching in a catalog, that is accessible to you digitally, or by searching um, in a domain online where you can access lots of digitized texts um, and get a sense of what you're actually uh, working with. And that may be necessary. Well, for the visual content, of course, um, you want to be very careful about noting what type of visual content, where it appears, um, any other characterization that you might wish to make figurative, diagrammatic, you know, technical, narrative, I mean, et cetera. And you can go into as much detail as you wish. Again, reference photography or photography for publication is especially valuable in cap capturing something that's visual that otherwise fails, you know, verbal description. So when it comes to the transcript, the history and the transmission, so by this we're talking about colophon and other paratexts, annotations and then of course especially the owner's marks that's really essential <laughs> so um, as far as to what degree you detail each of these the colophon or colophons um, quite essential um, the other paratexts um, title pieces um, potentially you know navigational information like you might be able to indicate the presence of a fehrest or um, or something like that, but you don't necessarily need to detail, lay out all the contents. You might want to photograph it or something like that, um, but that is not necessarily as essential. Um, when it comes to other annotations, it again, it depends on the level of detail that you can that you can address. If you don't, and, and a kind of the situation, if you don't have a colophon, but you have some owner's marks that are dated, then you definitely want to pay attention to those and to document them because that can at least give you what we call like a terminus antiquem or you can at least know it had to have been produced before this date um, and that can help you approach your approximate dating if you can examine the paper then all the better but there may be some other really interesting of course transmission information that's that's often valuable even if you haven't yet asked those questions that um, the evidence for which is contained in those annotations so Reference, to the extent that you can take reference photographs, I suggest try to capture all of that. The um, extent of the transcription that you do and so forth ultimately depends on your time and then your own interrogation of the, of the source material. But it can be really valuable um, and rich information and challenging and good for your paleography. So now other material that you can incorporate into the description references so especially references to standard biobibliographical sources 
like Brockelman, for example, or Story, or Rip Carl Brown, or, you know, I'm Birnbaum or Rio for some of the catalogs from the British Museum. Um, other, other important catalogs that you recognize to be significant or other important publications relevant to the work that you're doing and the transmission of this particular work. Um, references are really valuable. References may also be part of what you are relying on in for your identification or for maybe the dating of the paper or any contextual information relating to individuals that are named that's helping you ascertain a date or otherwise assess the history. So. Um, those may not always be something that you're <coughs> addressing in the moment, but there's something that eventually, if you're compiling a complete description and a full kind of analysis that you'll want to incorporate. And then like things like the state of preservation, um, you may not feel competent to really assess, but you can, you can mention if it, if it, if it looks particularly damaged or it's, you know, the paper is particularly brittle or, it's missing a lower cover <laughs> or it has no cover at all. You know, things like this you can kind of generally sort of get at um, and that can be quite useful. And then other kinds of observations that we just may not have anticipated, um, you know, that relate to like a special housing that it has or um, maybe something just particularly, I don't know, unusual about the format. Um, or or that sort of thing something that maybe even we haven't even haven't even anticipated or talked about yet something that you encounter for the first time so just you know that doesn't that basically kind of falls outside your scheme just be prepared because it could who knows what you may encounter okay